Hello, I'm Dori Nando. You can catch up with all the fun on the Cosmopolitan Mix and on all our shows via podcast. Just go to my Joy Online podcast and search for your favorite show and relive those moments all over again. Only on Joy 99.7 FM, radio for discerning listeners. Super Hits Radio, radio. Joy 99.7. Good morning and welcome to AM News. Now, first story, the Ghana Police Service has begun investigations into the murder of three persons at Abesim in the Bono region. This was after the service announced the arrest of a second suspect. The unnamed suspect joins the first suspect, 28-year-old Richard Apia, in police custody. The Inspector General of Police, Dr. George Ekufu Dampare, has directed the homicide investigative team from CID headquarters to take over the case. Superintendent Alexander Kweku Obing, Director of Public Affairs, Ghana Police Service, spoke on behalf of the IGP. The Inspector General of Police paid a visit to the traumatized community of Abyssin and then the family members affected and conferred with the regional police command and the incident scene management team. He has directed accordingly that one, the two suspects are in our custody, the suspect appear. Uh, the second one name would help to s help us with our ongoing investigation to unravel what, how, where that were involved in this heinous incident. Again, he directed that a homicide investigation team from CID headquarters takes over the case to Accra. Again, the remains, the federal direct will be, is being moved to police service, Ghana Police Service Hospital Mock in Accra for forensic pathology analysis and examination to support the, this investigation. Let's move up north now. Pupils of the Boenia Primary School in the Kasena Nakana West District of the Upper East Region are not exactly looking forward to returning to school when their current vacation is over. This is because one of the roofs of their classroom blocks has been blown off by a storm. As a result, they are forced to end their lessons and close for the day anytime it's threatening to rain. Our correspondent, Albert Sorry, who visited the school just before they went on vacation, reports that some of the children have stopped attending school because of the situation. In March this year, a rainstorm blew away more than half of the roof of the upper primary block of the Buania DE Primary School in the Kasana Nankana West District of the Upper East Region. Since then, school authorities have struggled to manage with the situation. They are compelled to combine two classes in one classroom for lessons, and this is creating congestion and lots of discomfort for the pupils. The headmistress and teachers sit under this mango tree to do administrative work because the roof of their office was also blown off by the storm. Headmistress of the Buania Primary School, Rebecca Alugovilla, says children in the community are losing interest in education because of the precarious situation at the school. This situation has also brought the enrollment of the school down because parents are afraid that when they bring their work, in case Anna, uh, any other rain is coming, it may blow off the remaining roofing sheet on top of the building and may wound their children. The enrollment is getting down. Parents are refusing bringing their walls because the place is not a safety place for the children. Members of the Buania community, in their effort to help solve the problem, mobilized some funds to try and erect a temporary shelter for the peoples. But that project has stalled due to lack of funds. According to the Assembly member for Buania, Frederick Aoveri, a decision was taken to erect the new shelter 
instead of re-roofing the existing classroom block because engineers at the district assembly advised them to do so. We were able to uh, raise about um, 12,000 Ghana cities, which we went to consult um, our engineer, the district engineer where the advice was given to us that the school is beyond repair that's the whole structure so it would not be prudent for us to use that little fan in trying to maybe repair the whole structure thereby we started with this foundation that we want to raise the pavilion for people to be able to learn in we are there by pleading to the government to try and come to our aid school enrollment has decreased from 200 pupils to 164 in the just ended term alone according to the headmistress those children at the school who are still determined to keep pursuing their academic dreams despite the challenges are calling for help storm has destroyed our school for a long time so we are begging government to come and help us For now, the pupils and teachers of the Buania Primary School can only pray for the arrival of the dry season, for it is their only hope of having uninterrupted days and maybe lessons at school. For Joy News, Albert Sorry, Buania. Kasana Nankana West District. And from today, persons riding motorbikes in the Upper West Region cannot use pillions after 6 p.m. Now, this is an order from the Regional Police Commander ACP Peter Anabugui. ACP Anabugui has also banned the use of Motor King tricycles at night. He says that these measures will help fight crime in the region. From Wa Rafiq Salam reports. New Upper West Regional Commander of the Ghana Police Service, ACP Peter Ndekuri Anaburi, takes office and swore to go after the criminals, even at the peril of his life. I am the chief watchman for the region, for that matter, and not a commander. I am not going to sit in my room and be sleeping snoring and say I'm the commander. When the next day, crime is everywhere. And that is why I have to put up this measure. And by putting up this message, I myself, together with my two IC, we need to supervise the officers that we have detailed them to execute the plan that we have drawn. I am not ready to succumb to any pressure. You like it or not, let's go by what I am saying. And the region shall be peace and shall be peaceful and calm for you and myself. He outlined strategies and measures to fight crime and illegal parking of vehicles on crowded streets in the region. No two young men shall be on a motorbike after 6.30 p.m. Whether you like it or not, that is, I want to tell you that security is very, very expensive. And if you don't get inconvenience, you can never get security. I want to tell you, I want to assure you. In Boku, for instance, it got to a time for two years, men were not even allowed to ride motorbikes. And yet, they were able to maintain the peace. So please, we should not take peace as a joke. Please, you bear with me. That now our roads have now turned to uh, what? Uh, I don't know whether it's supermarket or what. You go and see the motor seller, everything is on the road. I've entrusted that to the MTTU, and they are going to ensure that they will put them before court. The issue of passengers, spare riders, and picking up a passenger in a tricycle, already having two occupants, also came to the fore. No picking of Kambu after you have picked somebody in the night who is going home and you have charged him. Oh, I'm passing here to pitch somebody. It's unacceptable. And this will be made to the public. Even the police who are coming to supervise the disembarkment will ensure that if they pick a Kambu, nobody is sitting in the Kambu except the driver and the driver alone. Motor King tricycle operators, known locally here as Nyaba Lorry, were also not left out. Nyaba Lorries will not be permitted in the night. Nyaba Lorries. I've taken observation that all the break-in in the night, they always carry Nyabalor to go and put all their booty inside. So I am going to sit down with my empty, draw up a permit. It will announce it on the radio. If you have anything and you know that you use this in Nyabalor, I'm going to do ABC in the night. Please, you come to the empty tube for permit. If I pick in Nyabalor in the night, the next day you are going to court. Having listened to the upper regional commander of the Ghana Police Service, ACP Pit Ndekuru Anaburi, 
we roll into town to speak to trust cyclists about their views concerning the press conference. Teenagers riding the kambus. At times you apprehend one with the kambu and he said it belongs to the father. That it doesn't belong to you. That you are not a policeman. But now that the police is giving us this and the power, we can do that and even call the nearest police to arrest the person and go and detain him till the owner come, then the police will take the natural measures against the person. However, there's no groundswell of support on the move to ban riding with pillion after 6.30 p.m. The regional commander has to understand that in Upper West region, motorbike is the easiest means that we are having. And the time 2.30 is mentioning is too odd. At least you should have even moved it from somewhere 10 a.m. going. 10 p.m. Yeah, 10 p.m. going. I think that would be the best time. After 6.30, I think that's the time most people are even going to the house. So if you say you can't pick somebody after 6.30, I think the time is a little bit uh, too harsh. You should bring the time at least 10 p.m. However, there's mixed reaction on the dismantling of camps after 12 midnight. Some of the, if you look at it, it's an unemployment issue. If somebody gets to work and go to the work site and come out, definitely you'll be tired and you'll be asleep. Actually, for me, I don't have any work. So I can roam up to tomorrow. We are having people that in this community, every day they sleep tomorrow. Every day they sleep tomorrow. Every day they sleep tomorrow. So after this one, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good decision. But if there's a work for the youth, we'll sleep at a normal time. But if, this, if there's no work, we'll sleep every day tomorrow, every day tomorrow, every day tomorrow. It's rainy season. You will leave your wife and this cold weather. You will leave your wife and come and sit at, at the camp for getting to 12. What are you doing there? I think there are seasons that you can sit beyond, but for this season, rainy season, the weather is too cold, there are mosquitoes everywhere. At least by 7, 8, 9, you should be in the house. The major stumbling block in the fight against crime in the region is a subculture of the people normally referred to here as Ijabunyini, to which we are all one. Here, the courts are not used to solve the issues. The people prefer to solve them outside. ACP Peter Ndekure Anaburi has two options to fight crime using the law courts or use the Tijabuina subculture and fail wavefully. Time surely will be the best judge. Reporting for the news, Rafik Salam. Wa. The government has been asked to draw useful lessons from the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had and build social protection structures that would better protect the country's most vulnerable in case of another crisis in the future. Now, civil society groups that have been monitoring the impacts of government's policy interventions during the pandemic have met to make recommendations from their experience and make recommendations as well for the future. Christiana Bedema, who works with the United Nations Children's Fund. We were working with the CSO platforms and some of them went to monitor some of the interventions that were put in place by government during the lockdown and also what has been happening since March 2020. So a lot of work has been done and many interventions were in place. But it's important that we reflect as stakeholders to understand what the gaps were, the challenges, what should we learn from this? And what is it for us as a country? What can we do better? So we partnered with the Saint Ghana and the European Union to organize this forum, to be able to bring together partners, to have this kind of reflection, and also make sure that going forward, we make sure that our system is more robust and uh, more prepared to respond to emergency situations. Dr. Esther Ofeabwaji, who coordinates the platform of CSO groups in social protection, told Joy News on the sidelines of the meeting that there was a need for citizens to demand social protection as a right and not a handout from government. Even though we do social protection in Ghana, the attention to rights has been lacking. So because of that, the social protection that we do is often not properly prioritized. Sometimes you see that money is finished. Sometimes the targeting these are arguments that the people who should really benefit, the people who are at risk, who are poor, are not getting the support that they need. And so it emerged that we should have or we should stimulate a conversation 
on promoting rights as a basis for doing social protection. Let's move to the Volta region now. Some 20 disabled women from that area have benefited from a skill development program to enhance their livelihoods. The initiative, implemented by the Women with Disability Development Advocacy Organization, saw the beneficiaries train in wreaths and wigs making to enable them have a sustainable income generating avenue. Fred Kwame Asare reports. and the home municipality went through two weeks training in wreath and wig making. The facilitators taught the beneficiaries how to use waste cartons, liquid packaging boards or paper board to produce wreath. They were also trained in record keeping and business management to enable them to operate their businesses well to avoid running at a loss. Executive Director of the Women with Disability Development Advocacy Organization, Veronica Kofiedu explained why her outfit organized the training. Most of our members don't have the requisite qualifications and education to uh, enter into the formal uh, employment. And the state has not got uh, enough employment opportunities for us, we women with disabilities. Therefore, that's the main reason why we have initiated this uh, project to enable members to acquire skills, employable skills that will make them self-reliant and economically uh, dependent on their, their, their own, on their own. We seek to achieve economic independence for all our members who undergone this training so that they can be on their own, they can feed themselves, they can uh, provide their own health needs, provide, be able to procure their assistive devices on their own. The Chief Executive Director of Voice Ghana, Francis Asson, explain his outfit would consider sourcing for funds to provide seed capital for the beneficiaries. Yes, so my message was uh, to, to facility power for that matter, the trainees today, was more about how they should go back home and practice what they have learned and then be able to make good use of the time that they spent here for the two good weeks sales training. And they should be very honest to themselves and be able to really manage their businesses very well. They shouldn't take it just that they have gotten another skills and they're going back the same way they came. No, they should really make sure they put whatever they learn into practice. And with a voice Ghana support to the organization Wodau, we'll be able to see how best we can reach out to their donor again for some funding support in the future. And we are going to, we are committed to that. We also committed to supporting the organization to stand on its own. The beneficiaries loaded Wodau for the training, promising to use what they've learned to enhance their livelihood. The initiative was supported by the Bente Scan Guard Independent Living Fund with 40,000 Norwegian kroon, which is equivalent to 27,000 Ghana cities. This Fred Kwame Asai, Joy News, who... And that's it for AM News this morning. Don't go anywhere. The AM show continues with Izolai and myself. Hello, I'm Dori Nando. You can catch up with all the fun on the Cosmopolitan Mix and on all our shows via podcast. Just go to My Joy Online podcast and search for your favorite show and relive those moments all over again. Only on Joy 99.7 FM, radio for discerning listeners. All right, it's time for the news review on the AM show with uh, myself, Israel, and uh, Nimwa. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and the newspapers are in. So we're going to start with the Daily Graphic. Okay. And I'll okay. try and make it, as, uh, <laughs> make it through as quickly as possible. Okay. All right, so on the front page of the Daily Graphic, nearly created regions, 96 projects underway. That's uh, Dan Boche. And I'll just go straight to the story, and you can find the full story. It starts on the front page. It continues on page three. I think the most important um, thing you should get out of the story is that so 96 projects underway, six regional administration blocks. So six, 
24 two-story blocks for decentralized agencies, three completed, one inaugurated, and then 66 bungalows. So these are the projects, the 96 projects, 66 bungalows, 24 two-story blocks, and six regional administration blocks. That's the story for you. It's on the front page of the Daily Graphic. And then gory accidents, 19 perish. And that's very, very unfortunate that um, we're having these, uh, acc these accidents that are happening on our roads, a carnage on our roads. Police mount special cameras to enhance surveillance. And I'll go to that story. It's on page 16. And essentially, the police have mounted uh, some special surveillance, uh, some cameras to enhance surveillance. And they're saying that this time, the cameras can grab people or capture people, video and photos who are uh, flouting road regulations and you can be sent to court. So once they grab you, the cameras are able to pick your, the vehicle's registration and then it will reach out to, DV, they will reach out to DVLA and get the owner of the vehicle, your contact, and then they'll uh, send you to court. They'll get your details and send you to court. So it's in there. In, uh, on page, you can get the details on page 16. And then the gory accidents, 19 perish, 19 people died in two separate crashes. At the weekend in the central and eastern regions, the central region crashed in the morning of yesterday at Gumwa Mampong on the Akrake Coast Highway resulted in the death of 10 persons on board two vehicles. And 26 other passengers are in critical condition at the trauma and specialist hospital in Winneba. Then in the eastern region, nine persons, including a six-month-old baby, died on the spot in a crash on the Accra Komasi Highway at Achim Apeja Pig Farm Junction near Suhum in the Ibuakwa South Municipality in the eastern region yesterday evening. Uh, yesterday evening. Okay. So yeah, so these accidents are still happening and we seem to know what needs to be done except we, we are not doing them. One of the things that needs to be done is the enforcement, enforcement of the speed limits on our roads. That is not happening. Well, the police say they have um, they set up this special, these special cameras, and they're going to be doing that. Hopefully, that's going to happen uh, anymore. Yeah. So uh, let's move on. Still in the. Uh, graphic NDC threatened by agenda 111. That's uh, the MPP saying that. Yana comments Mahama for leadership role. And President begins seven day visit to Germany. President is in Germany, and amongst the things he's going to be doing there, he's going to be uh, meeting with uh, Pfizer to see how they can set up a vaccine, a National Vaccine Institute. Or Ghana. He would also be making the case for the procurement of more vaccines for use in Ghana and address the meeting of the German investment community for participating in the G20 Compact Initiative program. And one billion dollar IMF support arrives today. That's also in the daily graphic. And let me get to some more of the stories in there. Now, Ghana's leadership clout unquestionable as a former Israeli ambassador. Then on the, um, page uh, 32, disparity between policy interest rates not right. That's President Kufado saying that he wants the central bank to do something about it. So it says, it is surely not right that the central bank's monetary policy rate stands at 13.5%. While the commercial banks lend to the private sector at rates of 21% and above. Yes, it's a concern. GHS, Ghana Health Service, adopts peer to peer strategy in adherence to COVID 19 protocol. And, uh, let's move on. News, there's a news feature in the center spread of the Daily Graphic Okada, monster on our roads. And it's one of the things that needs to be dealt with if we're going to deal with the carnage on our roads as well, because a lot of people are dying as a result of uh, on Okada. Moving on, enduring legacy of John Mensa Saba. That's an opinion piece in the daily graphic. Okay, Nima, you probably may want to take a few more. Um, take your. I should go on to the daily guide. Then we'll come back and, and finish the 
daily guide. Okay, all too. right then. Okay, so let's do um, the daily guide this morning and some of the stories on the front page. NDC is afraid of Agenda 111, and that's according to the NPP. Um, President Anakufado is in Germany. I'm sure you know that already. Yinam T-Vet Center at 80% completion stage. Abessim cannibal grabs with bodies in fridge. That story has been um, talked about a lot over the weekend. Um, I was a 28-year-old guy, um, and he the, they found two bodies um, in his fridge, cut up parts, and then one on his living room floor. Um, three, three children, ages from about 14 through to about 16. Um, so that's under investigation. He is in um, custody. So keep our eyes on that. Bring you a little bit of that later on in the show. Ex-NDC MP thanks Akufado for pardon. Um, and let me go straight into the papers. Now this morning, there's a lot of accidents being reported. Um, so 10 dead, 26 injured in another Winneba Road accident. Um, there are a few more in some of the other pages. But before I, I bring you that, okay, let's do this one. Carless driver kills nine at Apedua Junction. So nine passengers, including a six-month-old baby, have been killed in a fatal accident that occurred at Apedua section of the Accra Kumasi Highway in the eastern region last Saturday night. Um, so another one, 10 dead, 26 injured. Then we have this one. Um, but let's also do some international stories. U.S. enlists commercial airlines to help in Afghan evacuation. 40 feared kidnapped after raid on Nigerian town. U.S. East Coast braced for Storm Henry. Gosh, another storm um, coming up. U.S. accuses Ethiopia of blocking aid to Tigray. And um, that's on page five of the Daily Guide. Um, center spread. Okay, there's a story about Sarkodie. And we're jealous of your Ghanaian support. That's a question. Obibini Jab Sarkodie. So Sarkodie, as you know, is in Nigeria. Um, and he went to one of... Um, the, their radio stations, one of their top radio stations, and um, the presenter was talking to him, I was telling him that it looks as if he's not really supported as much in Ghana as he should be. And they're asking him, you know, why? Why is it like that? Is it that, you know, you know how maybe when you sing too much to somebody or that you put out music that is fire, or you'll be jabbing people. So the reasons were being explored, but um, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think that we don't celebrate Sarkozy enough here in Ghana? Uh, I don't know about that. Anyway, other entertainment stories. Former Big Brother star Toby marries heavily pregnant fiance. Efia Nocturnal kisses Sefa at extreme party. Anna Dompre grabs most impactful member of parliament award. Okay, other stories. Nana inaugurates New Bank of Ghana board. Um, Sergeant Ajete's last surviving son dies age 50. And a worrying story here. 45-year-old man has killed his wife. Um, who was 30. Apparently, they got into an argument and he went into the room, picked up a gun and then, you know, just shot her. And um, he is in custody as well. But um, I think that brings up about four of these kinds of killings that we've seen in the last month or so. Other stories. Um, okay, let me just go to sports now. Before that, over 20 artists to rock GMA UK. So the Ghana Music Awards is going to happen in the UK. Um, and we know that Samini was there. He went last week or so. Um, but Akwaba Jr. will be joining him. Famiye, Kofi Jama, Jackie, Medical, Miss Bell, um, John Opon, Wiala, and so many more. So keep your eyes out for that. Man videos himself hitting the statue of Kofi B. Florence Obinim bounces back with Adichie Munsem. Um, so that's more entertainment. Let's do some sports on the back page of the Daily Guide. Ronaldo told me he is staying. Klopp terms Burnley tactics as wrestling. I believe in the squad, as according to Ghanaian coach C.K. Akono. He has expressed strong belief in the squad ahead of next year's AFCON. Um, he also said, I think, last week that he wasn't feeling any pressure um, that the team had to win the AFCON, and we sent him some pressure. So this week we are reinforcing the pressure um, <laughs> to C.K. Akona. We do want a cup. You know, it's about time. It's about bloody time. Um, other stories, Glyco top up Hazakas lady ladies package and um, that's it for the daily guide and back to israel who is returning to okay yes uh, but i don't have a lot to do <laughs> i'll just quickly go through the sports in kegbe rejects decision to drop him from paralympics and we are pretty ready to work with any club okay. also Techi's trainer confirms uh, pro career so <clears throat> the trainer of olympics uh, bronze medalist mm -hmm. Techi says his team 
is weighing their potential bids from interested managers and promoters for a possible signing for professional career. That's, uh, uh, well, we wish him all the best. And then on the back page, Brent's building at Mokula pulled down mm. and Adedome installs two rival chiefs in five Adedome. days. Okay. They're still having these things. Two rival chiefs in mm. five days. Yeah. It's certainly going to be a problem. A problem, isn't it? We'll okay. We'll deal with it subsequently. All right. Okay. Um, on okay, I'm going to do the business and financial yeah. times. And um, really quickly, banking sector holds 50% of government's domestic debt. Analysts bemoans crowding out effects on private sector. MTN CEO Seloma Darivo says we will continue to brighten lives. Inadequate funding derails Venture Capital Trust Fund and Coco Board seeks collateralized loan. Charlie, sometimes the English is very, very big. Like if you're not careful, Charlie, like collateralized loan to refinance debts. Okay, so let's just do a quick look through the paper. IMF provides $1 billion in SDR to shore up foreign exchange reserves. African insurers to deliberate on revolutionizing insurance services. Enhanced security alerts, maximum surveillance systems, and increased religious tolerance needed to secure world peace um, following the Taliban takeover of the Afghan government. This is a piece by Francis Xavier Sozu. So enhanced security alerts, maximum surveillance system, and increased religious tolerance. Those are the ingredients for world peace, according to him. All right, um, more stories. Provide better wages and salaries for labor to increase economic productivity. Can I get an amen? Um, provide, let me read, I'm gonna read it again. Okay. Provide better wages and salaries for labor. Amen. To increase economic productivity. Now this is um, by Michael Sumaila. He talks about why you know, people should be paid properly. And he talks about the fact that a typical example is the Chinese economy. And that in 2014, data showed that more than 160,000 manufacturing companies in China realized that increases in minimum wage resulted in lower survival probability of low productive companies. They explained this finding by the fact that productivity in surviving companies improved significantly, allowing firms to absorb the higher labor costs without hurting their employment or their profitability. So, hashtag raise our salaries. Okay, other stories. Don't stop, but regulate promotional messages and um, frustration. Um, a couple of other stories. Um, middle page. How Africa can seize the moment and start resetting its relationship with the IMF. Um, and this one should be interesting for you, um, my darling Israel. Yeah. Financial struggles of the youth in 2021. Okay. I, I, I said that because you're very interested in the youth, aren't you? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, so this is talking about the financial struggles that the youth are going through. So, okay. Seven-member NAFCO governing board inaugurated. And um, let me just quickly go to the back page. Goyal opens 410th service station at Darkman. Government's initiatives are suffering due to some MMDA's neglect. That's according to the <coughs> NDPC director general. That's it for the business and financial side. All right, so let me go to the Daily Statesman. Reckless driving kills 19 on bloody weekend. Horrific murder at, at the scene. Police arrest footballer for alleged trade in human parts. We'll be getting a lot more into this story, trying to understand who this gentleman is, the Richard Apia. There's some who are saying he's a footballer. They're saying he's a football pundit and all that. We'll get to understand. And hopefully we may get uh, the motive by speaking with the people who are in the community, people who know him and uh, what probably may have caused him to do that. Uh, President Task BOG of a lending rate is also here on the front page of the Daily Statesman. Task Force destroys Shanfang on River and Cobra. And uh, Olympic fish should spur us on to greater heights. That's on page three. Baumir urges uh, the Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College graduates to use expertise to help fight piracy and terrorism. And uh, President, Council of State presents petition on Chief Justice to President Kufuado. And there's, a, there's an opinion piece on the fatalities on the country's roads. They're becoming scary. That's here in the Daily Statesman. And uh, also, the uh, Daily Statesman, uh, Statesman, police investigate cause of death of man found in his room. It's uh, a curious one. So yes, and uh, pretty much, yeah, 
That's it. France in entertainment, Francis Gardin wants to maintain his original music identity. Tua Savi says Brandy is her biggest influence and talks about working with Nas. That's it for the Daily Statesman. Okay, I'm moving on to the Daily Dispatch this morning. I have a story that might interest you, Israel. I'll we'll get okay. to that in a second. On the front page, NPP National Chairman Slot, can Asamoa Boateng cause a surprise? And there's pictures of Mr. Edward Boateng, Mr. Asamoa Boateng, Mr. Stephen and Tim, Professor Ameya Okunfi, and Mr. Aban Kwaiabua. Um, other stories, buffer stock companies still working amidst pressure on food supply. And we should have a conversation on this, shouldn't we? Okay, Israel? which one? The buffer um, stock? The buffer stock, okay. yeah, and the pressure on food supply. Yes, and what that means, I mean. um, yeah, what that means for us moving forward. Okay, Obeda Samoa on the challenges of democracy in Ghana. Um, Eric, <laughs> Eric Mensah writes, in defense of Ajiman Menu, a word for the public office holder part two. Um, and this is the story I was talking about. Okay. Do women prefer circumcised or uncircumcised men? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I okay. should ask you. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> these are the statistics. I'm going to hit you with the statistics okay. this morning. Um, so this was done in Botswana, though, this um, um, data thingy, okay. whatever. And um, it was found that 50% of women preferred a circumcised partner, 7% preferred an uncircumcised partner, 21% had no preference, and 22% were unsure. <laughs> so there you go. Um, of circumcision and things. Yeah, yeah. Human rights of Ghana's coastal communities threatened by failure to tackle illegal fishing. There's a new report. And that's actually from myjoyonline.com. Okay. Um, finally, Akufado names 13 more envoys. Toyota, Tokyo, sorry, 2020 Olympic Games. Akufado rewards Teshi mm. with $30,000 and a car. And on the back page, NPP national chairman slot. Um, can a somewhat bought in course a surprise? That's it. That's my papers for this morning. Okay, and then in the finder, uh, MTNP heading digital solutions for Africa's progress. That's the CEO, Pulse Journalist Network to project maritime industry and address high lending rates. As President Kufado charging the BOG, and uh, also on and uh, in the finder, I've seen murder acting IGP appeals for community support for expeditious investigation. And corporate loans were already in default before appointment of new management. That's NIT coming back uh, on the, what has been said about their management of uh, the people's pensions. Yeah, essentially, yeah, that's about that's it. That's about it. Okay. Should we move to myjoyonline.com sure. this morning and see what we have um, for our stories? Okay. Um, the, the, the banner headline is, he was my friend, I could never has, have suspected him, father of murdered JHS students. Um, so I'm guessing that has to do with the Abyssin murders. Yeah. Priest kissing students, Anglican Church showed leadership as the director of FIDA International. She was speaking to Samson um, yesterday on the law. Okay. Does this from sharing identities of students kissed by Anglican priest, director of FIDA International? Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund not funding source for Agenda 111. That's according to Deputy Finance Minister. And of course, that argument has been going on about um, that 600 million um, that was supposed to be for Agenda 111, which apparently was spent in 2020 according to the budget and now somehow is being sourced from the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund. Deputy Minister is saying that that's not true. It's not from that fund. Um, so where is it from, really? Anyways, Kezia Azuma says every organization should formulate a harassment policy. Robbers make away with 21,000 Ghana CDs and fill-in station attacks at Obopa. And strangle man mistaken as a security guard. And in Goma Mampong, 10 dead, others injured in a car crash. And the director of FIDA Ghana has said students didn't consent to be kissed by Anglican priests. They were clearly ambushed. And IGP directs CID headquarters to assist in the investigation of murder of two children and one other at Abyssin. Okay, that's it for my Joy Online. And um, you can catch some more stories on there later on in the day. I think um, okay. Israel has something to tell Yeah, yeah. So now, okay. now that we're done with the news review, okay, and you didn't let me exhaust all my oh, time. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, the I daily didn't let well, you. the daily graphic. Okay. I'm coming back to it. Okay. So on, uh, on page five, there's a story about um, 
A private jet glitz characterized Nigeria's royal wedding. Probably there's some it's a big wedding in Nigeria. Private jets filled up the runway of the airport in the northern Nigeria city of Kano as members of Nigeria's elite and West African dignitaries flew in for the wedding of the president's son and the daughter of a prominent religious and traditional leader. The marriage of Yusuf Buhari to Zara Nasser Bayero is one of Nigeria's biggest celebrity events of the year. Thousands attended the event at the Palace of the Emir of Bichi Town in Kano. One historian told the BBC that a wedding between presidential and royal families was unprecedented in Nigeria. I see. And the pair actually met at the University of Syria in the UK. And they said the festiv their festivities continues last Saturday when the bride's father, Nasir Adubayero, was officially crowned as the Emir of Bichi. His brother is the Emir of Kano, one of Nigeria's most prominent Islamic leaders. So, yeah, I mean, you know how Nigerians, they like to do it really big. Yeah, yeah, if, this is a, a merging of, of money and the royal, power and oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. all sorts of things. Yeah. I'm sure people will fly. Of course, people flew in. I'm sure they were flying and they will say, yeah. Yeah. The wedding attracted dignitaries from all over the world. All over the world. Yeah. Interesting. I'm sure that it trended, sense. must have trended on Instagram and stuff yep. as well. In fact, one of the issues that came up in that wedding, there, there was those who were saying, some who were saying that the lady didn't dress, her dressing was an issue. Mm. So it says the BBC in Nigeria says the pre-wedding pictures of a bride caused controversy on social media with some calling the lady's uh, wedding, her clothing immoral because her shoulders were exposed while others defended her. Uh, because of the faith. Yeah. Because of the yeah, faith. Yeah. yeah. So let's put that in context because when you oh, say, yeah. you know, okay. it's, it's um, immoral, your mind is going to all sorts okay. of things. Like. Okay. So what do we have on the show today? All right. So we'll be talking about this Abessin murders. Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite worrying. The fact that we're having these things happening. We, we heard of the Kaswa incident where there were some young people involved. This, this time, so young on young, this time, okay, 28 on, on 14, you know, 15. Yeah, on, yeah. on teenagers. That, that's worrying. Mm. In fact, the guy chopped up the, the bodies, yeah. the bodies and, st and stuffed them in a fridge. It's quite disturbing. So we're trying to understand who this gentleman is and what may have gotten him to do something like that. And we know that the police will be conducting their investigations, but yes, we can also speak with the members of the community for them to tell us what they know about the young man. Mm. But ideally, we, we, when we have these conversations, I think one of the things we'll be looking out for is we should come to appreciate that our society has changed. Mm -hmm. It's not what it used to be. I mean, back then it was safe for a, a child, for you to send the child to go buy stuff in the neighborhood or even go really far. I mean, I was sent as a child, I'll go to the Usu market to go and buy charcoal, and it's quite a distance from the house. It was fine. We could walk to school. We're walking from Laboni to Usu to school, and yeah, there's was nothing sick. to worry about. Yeah. But these days, we can't do that. You can't, I mean, no. So you need to figure out, I mean, I appreciate the circumstances, the times in which, within which, uh, in which we live so that we also take uh, precautions and safeguard your, your children and everybody Indeed. else. Indeed. Yeah. So okay. that's one of the things. And then there's also the issue of the accidents that Happens, uh, have yeah. happened over the weekend. 19 people losing their lives. Their lives, yeah. <laughs> Including a six-month-old baby. Yeah. That's it's, tragic. It's heartbreaking. Really, really, yeah. really tragic. So Considering how much talking... We've been talking, you know, yeah. for a while now. And every weekend, every Monday morning, there's stories of, you know, of people that have died over the weekend, you know, because of um, car accidents. And it's, it's scary. You know, every time I, I move my car, you know, just doing the N1 to come to work, you know, you're just so focused, you know, on the road because, you know, there are these lorries that are just, you know, moving from lane to yeah. lane, you know, and it's like blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus, <laughs> blood of Jesus, you know, just to get to work. You know, and it shouldn't be shouldn't be that difficult. So we'll have that conversation as well, yeah. um, a little later on in the show. And then, of course, sports and um, and IB. Also, we have um, a graphic business stand big bank breakfast meeting, and we'll be having that conversation. Their theme this year is media and marketing communication post COVID, a catalyst for Africa's socio economic resurgence. 
It'll be happening on the 24th of August um, from 7 a.m. And it'll be live on the AM show and the AM Super Morning Show. That's tomorrow. Tomorrow's 24th August. But we'll be having that conversation uh, to get to know what's coming up tomorrow. So you may want to, you would want to stay tuned. Oh, you definitely want to stay tuned. Yeah. And of course, I'll find a way to um, traumatize Israel this morning, <laughs> as is my calling and my corporate social responsibility. But coming up next is the sports. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Hello, my name is Nathaniel Atta. You can catch up with all the fun and inspiration on the Joy Sports link here on Joy 99.7 FM together with all other shows over and over again. It's very simple. All you need to do is go to myjoyonline.com slash podcast and relive all of those fun moments over and over again. Joy 99.7 FM, your radio for the sermon listener. When Samuel Tachia left the shores of Ghana to the Tokyo Olympic Games, never for once did he think that those games were going to be a change in fortune for his life, as President Nana Ekufuado has rewarded him $30,000 for winning the country's only bronze medal in the competition. And Ghana's quest to end its 40 years of failure to win the Africa Cup of Nations is still on course. CK Akono says that Ghanaians are pessimistic but he's very confident in the abilities of his team. The Paralympic team have also left the shores of the country. They left in Tokyo. They arrived in Tokyo yesterday to participate in this year's game that starts on August 24. The Minister of Youth and Sports, Mustafa Usif, has tasked them to return to the country with the gold medal. Then we'll be wrapping up with some stories from the Premier League, where Arsenal, for the first time in their history, have played two matches, zero goals scored, zero points also secured in the English Premier League. I am Muftar Nabila Ablai, and this is how I welcome you to AM Sports. Let's talk about President Nana Ekufuado, who has announced that Tokyo 2020 bronze medalist Samuel Techi will be given a car, $10,000 in cash for his efforts at the Olympic Games, plus a further $20,000 to be put in a career development fund for him. The president made the announcement when Ghana's contingent for the Tokyo Olympic Games called on him at the Jubilee House last week, Friday. For the first time in 29 years, the Ghanaian flag was raised at the Olympics. <laughs> For the first time ever in Ghana's history of the Games, a Ghanaian athlete, Samuel Techi, was selected to represent Africa at the closing ceremony of the Olympic Games. <laughs> And for the first time in the history of this fourth republic, Ghana has won a medal at the Olympics. Out of the 52 countries that participated in the Games, Ghana placed 10th on the Afri African standings. And this should spur us on to even greater heights in future competitions. On behalf of the government and people of Ghana, I say a big hearty aiko to each one of you on this performance. You made all of us in Ghana very proud. As a show, a modest show of our gratitude, and on the basis of your individual performances, I'm happy to announce that one, each member of the team, it includes everybody involved, will receive a reward of 5,000 United States dollars. The medalist, Samuel Techi, will receive a car, $10,000, an additional $20,000 put in a career development fund for him for the next Olympic Games <laughs> and future tournaments. In total, the bonuses of the team amount to some $150,000 United States dollars. presenting his medal to Mr. President, proudly. <laughs> Mr. Techu, have a photo, a photo opportunity with Mr. President. <laughs> Uh, 
but let's continue and talk about the Paralympic Games where Sports Minister Muzaba Usif has challenged Ghana Paralympic team to do better than the able-bodied team that won bronze in the just-ended Tokyo Olympic Games. The minister tasked them to win gold. I want to hand over the flag of our country to the team so that you lift the flag of Ghana high whilst you are participating in the tournament. You saw what the, our brothers and sisters have done in the main Olympic uh, tournament, which has just ended. So I have no doubt at all that the para team are also going to make us proud. But by coming home with not only bronze, but gold, and this time not gold from Obuasi or Takwa, but gold from Tokyo. Let's talk about the Black Stars and its head coach CK Akono claims that Ghanaians are pessimistic about the national team's ability to win the next edition of the African Cup of Nations. According to him, the pessimism stems from the fact that the team has not won the trophy in nearly 40 years, but he is confident in the potential of the players to end the trophy drought. Well, I think what would take us to win is a, a bit of brilliance from all of us, uh, good team spirit. Um, and this I call for all of you, including you. I mean, we all have to now change from where we are to a, a, a bit of positivity. You know, the, the fact that I know some people doubt if we'll be able to make it or not. It's not about that again. Now, we've all been yearning for this, this opportunity to, to go and win the AFCON. We want to do it. We've all been talking about that. We are being negative. And so we, we need to change that aspect of, of our thoughts and thinking. Of course, we don't have any other uh, group of players. The ones we have are the ones we're using now. If, if you remember the last few matches, we've, we've really maintained a certain crop of players. And that if there's any other player that is good, doing well, we'll, we'll bring him in. And that is what we're doing. And we believe that gradually uh, we'll we, we be able to find ourselves you know, in a certain way. We understand what we have to do at every given time. Uh, ethics of work on the field of play, we do, we do understand that. And I think we've moved on from a certain uh, uh, position to, to a very positive. I believe that now the team is positive. The team uh, has found itself. Uh, we have structures which will try in this strategy to improve in that area. Uh, and and, and I, I strongly believe in, in the squad, you know, and I, I hope all of you will also do that. Uh, like I said earlier on, yes, I, I understand because in the last few years we've, we've tried and tried to come closer and, and it's, not, it's not worked. And so we, 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 we sort of been a bit negative when it comes to the, to the national team and that what my message to all of you, to be positive, think positive. Let's, let's, we've been dreaming about it, we want it and we'll find a way to, to get it. it at the moment, it doesn't, it doesn't look you know, to all of you. But to me, I believe, I believe in the squad. I believe that this, this will happen. Well, CK Akuno, he hasn't been paid his salary since the turn of the year, hoping that the Minister of Youth and Sport and his ministry will ensure he gets paid. Now let's talk about President of the Ghana Football Association. He has called on all and sundry to support the senior national team win AFCON and qualify for the FIFA World Cup in Qatar. Speaking at the funeral of the late Jones Alassane Abu, a former management committee member of the Black Stars, Kat said Jones was a committed man to Ghana football and this is the right time for everyone who loved him to support the Black Stars to win. My name is Kuju Yangson. Let me tell you how to turn back time. You can now bring back all the fun, all the excitement, all the controversy of the Super Morning Show and all your favorite joy shows when you go to myjoyonline.com forward slash podcasts. Just select your favorite show and bring it all back again. Joy 99.7 FM, radio for discerning Super listeners. Radio, radio, Joy 99.7. All right, so this is the AM show with myself, Israel, and uh, Nimwa, and we'll be getting into the show proper. Uh, thanks to you, uh, 
Muftal for bringing us sports. Sports, I, sports. I have a, a quick birthday dedication. I want to put it out there. It's uh, to Superintendent Rosina Adjoa Donko Gariba. You're currently serving is on a peacekeeping mission in South Sudan. And this is from your husband, DCOP Vans Gariba. And uh, he says he wishes you a lovely, lovely birthday. It's, um, and I, I will use this opportunity to, to send the, a shout out out there to all those people, police, military, who are serving outside the country in Sudan and various parts of the country. I think there's some in uh, Afghanistan, not sure though, <laughs> but well, <laughs> may the Lord be with you. Indeed. And, uh, and, and indeed. keep you safe. Now, the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry in partnership with GIZ Unido, Ghana Enterprises Agency, formerly MBSSI, Joy Business, KPMG, IFC, Standard Chartered Bank and Bank of Africa, is organizing the Chamber SME Business Forum under the theme, Redefining Success, the case of SMEs in Ghana. The purpose of the forum, a quarterly event, is to provide a high-level platform to deliberate on topical issues and make policy recommendations relating to the sustainable growth and development of SMEs in Ghana, as well as explore new business partnerships. The Minister of Trade and Industry, Alan Chermanting, is a special guest of honor with Akusia Fremo Sel Pari, Chief of Staff, Office of the President, as a keynote speaker. It's happening on Wednesday, August 25, 2021, at 9 a.m. and it's the, ven the venue is La Palm Royal Beach Hotel Accra. You're warmly invited to join other distinguished industry players and policy makers to discuss the strategies critical for building business value, resilience and sustainability, as well as explore new business partnerships. For more information and reservations, please call Brigitta on 050-126-0141 or Nathan on 050-151-0499. I'll take the numbers again, 050-126-0141 for Brigitta. And Nathan, 050-151-0499. Contribution to cost is 200 CDs. All right. So anyway, we're moving on to the show and the issue has to do with the Abbasim murder, mm -hmm. which happened uh, over the weekend. And, well, the story broke over the weekend. This, it's in, we've got some gory details coming out of it. Some of the images that were shared, of course, we can't share the images with you. But, yeah, you've, I'm sure you've seen uh, some of the images that came out. I mean, it's graphic, 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 graphic stuff. Well, police have arrested two people for the death of three people in the Abunu region. That's the Abbasi murder that I'm talking about. Now, we have some details from the police. They've been sharing some information with us as far as uh, the, the murders are concerned. Let's hear from the police and then we'll get onto the ground and speak with our correspondent to give us uh, a lot more details. So let's hear from the Director of uh, Public Affairs, Superintendent Alex Kuku Obeng, who spoke on behalf of the Inspector General of Police, Dr. Georgia Kufu Dampari. The Inspector General of Police paid a visit to the traumatized community of Abyssin and then the family members affected and conferred with the Regional Police Command and the Incident Scene Management Team. He has directed Accordingly, that one, the two suspects are in our custody. The suspect appear. And the second one, name would help to help us with our ongoing investigation to unravel what, how, where <laughs> that were involved in this heinous incident again. He directed that a homicide investigation team from CID headquarters takes over the case to Accra. Again, the remains, if further direct, will be, is being moved to police service, Ghana Police Service Hospital, Mok, in Accra. 
for forensic pathology analysis and examination to support the, this investigation. We are aware that there are traumatized persons involved in this crime, i.e. the affected family members, the community members, and even the police officers who are involved in this uh, scene search and investigation, that they need to be supported psychologically. So clinical psychologists and counselors have been dispatched to support persons affected. Again, we are aware that police alone cannot solve all issues and incidents like this. And the members of the public are very critical in police accident investigation process. Therefore, two police liaison officers have been selected and will avail their services from tomorrow. And this will be spearheaded by the Bono Regional Police Command. And their work is simple to liaise with their members or their families affected and the police so that we were able to know how far we have gone to the accident investigation and issues that bothers the family members through them the administration will know and uh, deliver swift uh, redress. All right, so you had uh, Superintendent Alex uh, Obeng speaking there about the incident. Now, it, we know a bit about the story, mm -hmm. which is the fact that the, there was this gentleman who, you know, murdered, supposed to have murdered yeah. the stepbrother, mm -hmm. essentially, went for him from the house, and then subsequently they got to find out that the guy was was killed and then the police went to the house they also found out there were other bodies yeah. and some of the bodies uh, stuffed in the refrigerator but let's get to precious samavor he's been following the story for i mean since it broke and he has a lot more detail on it so precious let's bring us up to speed there we're, we're told that there's this gentleman who's involved who's supposed to be a footballer and then another man has also been arrested in connection with the crime. Just tell us all that has happened, Precious. Yeah, so Israel, the yes, a 28-year-old, as you said earlier, a draftsman, uh, as they call him as an architect, and then a quack seller. Yeah. That is what he does uh, for a living. Uh, him being a footballer, he played at a grassroots level only up to the second division, uh, a Sunyani-based second division club known as Kumapim. Uh, checks indicate that last year he was registered for the club, uh, but same cannot be said for this particular uh, season. And uh, going through what happened, yes, his own stepbrother, a twin, the, the junior of the twin is the one who got missing on Friday. That's what triggered the, the search and ultimately uh, leading to the other bodies, you know, in his room. Now, he was last seen with this, uh, his stepbrother, but later when they were looking for him, he feigned knowledge and claimed that he had escorted his brother uh, to go to their mother's store, which is the store and then where he lives in a self-contained apartment. In fact, the building that you see behind uh, Alexander or being the public uh, affairs director is where this Richard Appiah, the suspect, lives and lives there alone. So that is the house. And from that house to the store is about 300 uh, or so meters apart. So he claims that he escorted his brother uh, to go back. But uh, they continued insisting, uh, together with the police, 
They went to the house. Some young men had to uh, go behind the house, uh, tear the net, uh, peep through, and then their suspicion level got heightened. So they, they entered the house, a particular room that they, they suspected that a fridge was operating in the room, uh, accompanied with some uh, foul scents. Uh, he insisted that the room belongs to someone, and for that matter, uh, the occupant is not available, and he will not allow them to enter. But they forced themselves to open uh, the door only uh, to, to, to see the lifeless body uh, in, the, in the house. And then upon further search, that is when they, they found the, the body parts starched in the double door uh, refrigerator. Now, Precious, I want us to backtrack a little to where the point where they couldn't find this little boy, his stepbrother. Uh, so I it, understand it, it that. It was a time that, as well as the vigilance of the family. And yeah, Precious, as I was saying, I, I want us to backtrack a, a little and get to the point where the boy went missing, when they couldn't find the boy. What steps did the family take to try to look for the boy and how did they end up uh, finding this this young man who is uh, currently the suspect so when when it's it's getting to evening or if uh child with, is with you after a while if you don't uh, see him you start asking uh, around and according to the parents uh, that is exactly what uh, they did uh, until uh, they, they got to know that his brother, Richard Apia, uh, is alleged to have uh, returned from town with uh, some uh, food and then took him along to the house uh, to go and eat the food. So when they were looking for him, that is when Richard said that he escorted him to go back to their mother. But some also insisted that they did not see in, see, uh, uh, between the, the store, which is Alaska Junction, and then where Richard lives, it's, you have a lot of uh, stores along the street. People, so if you are passing, uh, people will easily identify you that, okay, within the last few minutes or an hour, you came to pass. Yeah. So nobody could collaborate the story that he had escorted the boy back uh, to the parent. And uh, the insistence, uh, they, they, I don't know what triggered their suspicion that uh, Richard is the last person uh, they, they saw with a child, and for that matter, he should produce uh, the mother. At a point in time, it was uh, an exchange uh, between Richard and then uh, the mother that he hasn't seen the, the, the brother. The mother insisted that I'm told you uh, was last seen with him. So that is what uh, triggered the, the suspicion, and they started pushing pushing, pushing him they, with the police. They went to the house, uh, raining Saturday night. Uh, they went to the house, continued searching. And then, lo and behold, uh, they found the lifeless body uh, of uh, these children. And then the other one cuts and then starts into the fridge. Now, two of them, uh, the police have been able to identify two of them. Uh, the, the twin brother, uh, Junior, uh, Louis Ajiman who got missing on Friday, and that is the beginning of all this. And the one who was uh, cut and stuck into the fridge uh, is uh, Sapon, Stephen, 15-year-old uh, GHS2 you know, student. Uh, and then the third person that the police is yet to identify uh, this person. So this third person that the police is yet to identify, nobody in the community is saying that they have their son or ward missing. Yes, uh, as at now, uh, for those who initially went there and uh, nobody has uh, made complaints to the police for the police to allow them to go and see the lifeless body uh, of that person who is now uh, being kept or preserved as a private mortuary at Mantuka. Nobody as at now has come out to identify uh, that this is my relative or this is my child. So the suspects uh, who is alleged to have killed the, the stepbrother want to know a bit more about him. You say that he's a draftsman, he's an architect, and then he also he's once plays, played football. That goes to suggest that he probably may be a, a, 
quite a popular young man in the community. Yes, uh, he goes by the nickname Fire or Fireman uh, in, in, in the neighborhood. Uh, personally, I've, I've, uh, not, not, not a friend, but you know, I, I know him in, in Sunyani. Uh, I've seen him a couple of times. Uh, quite a nice uh, young man. Uh, no one who attributes any uh, violent attitude or you know, aggressive behavior uh, or, or any, anything for that matter to, to reach it. Uh, he's, he's quiet, he goes about his, his activities, he dresses well. Uh, so it's uh, residents who tell you that he will be the last person that they would have uh, suspected uh, to be hiding the children and committing such a crime and living within uh, them to the extent that they don't uh, know that he's involved in such an activity. So uh, quite a nice guy, uh, very popular. He played football, as I said, he's in two uh, clubs. Uh, you know, if you're a footballer, because of the, uh, the attraction and the fact that he also played in a community gala representing Abyssin, uh, competing with other communities within the Sunni. Okay, so for so Precious's video seems to have uh, frozen, so we have lost connection with him. But yes, we would want to know a bit more about this gentleman. Uh, Precious, do we know if he has a, yeah. a, a girlfriend? He, I'm sure he has friends. What are they saying about it? My girlfriend, uh, I'm unable to confirm uh, that, but yes, uh, he has friends uh, who, uh, some of them, a uh, couple of days, and even those who saw him on that same Friday. And Israel, the, the, I don't know if you've heard from the, the story of the father of the boy who was killed and stuck into the yeah. fridge. We, we, will come, uh, he, we will come to him in a bit. I, I was just mm -hmm. hoping that we could get to get a bit more detail on uh, this, uh, Richard appear gentleman and what his friends have been saying subsequently did he drop any hints they are, they are shocked uh, Israel, they are shocked they are surprised that uh someone they know they never imagined that he, he was that kind of a person because of the way he carried himself in the community the way he relates with them uh, he goes about his activities and uh, they they are just confounded. They they just don't know what to to think about him and uh, other people uh, going for it. Now we know that the young boy, the stepbrother, who was killed, was killed probably on Friday because that was when he went missing. Do we know yeah. about the other two when they died? So the. Unidentified body assets now, uh, very little information is known about, about him yet. Right. But the one who was killed, cut into pieces, stuck into a fridge, he got missing a little over a week ago. All right. Yes, a little over a week ago. Now, Friday gone by, because of the fact that Richard appeared a suspect, uh, is involved in uh, surveying and, and all that he was selling some property that the second victim, that is uh, Stephen Sapon, his father, Mr. Yabua Esuyama, is a business partner with this suspect. So he sold the property for him. Friday evening, they went to deliver an amount of 115,000 Ghana cities to Richard up here. And then the father is saying that Richard even asked them if they still have not found their missing child. And he said, yes, they are still looking for him. So it's, 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 it's quite interesting that he has this man, this boy, but he was still asking the father if you've not found your, your child. A business partner so, so partner so the father was surprised that his partner his friend would do that to his child 
and still come around him and play innocent. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite shocking. And so what we know now is that the police, the police has directed that the, essentially the investigation has been taken over by the CID headquarters. We know that the IJP was there and he has been interacting with the family. So that's the stage of the, at which we are, as far as the investigations are concerned. Just bring us up to speed on that. Yeah, so the IGP and his team were in town yesterday. Uh, they, they were first briefed by the Bono Regional Police Command at the Abitim Police Station where the incident was first reported. Uh, after the briefing, the IGP together with his team, they went to the chief palace, the chief of Abitim, uh, Berima Kumi uh, on a closed door discussion. Uh, after that, he continued to the to meet the families uh, of the victims uh, in two separate uh, closed door you know meetings. Thereafter, he went to the uh, the accident scene or the crime scene. Uh, to ascertain things uh, for himself, although the place was. So he did not enter the house to, to as it were, uh, look at things, but he stood outside at a distance. And uh, he was briefed by the investigation team, the crime uh, management team, and, 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 and all that. So it was there after that he announced uh, through the public affairs director. Uh, that they have. In addition, Richard uh, in their custody and uh, directed that the investigation be moved to Accra so that the homicide investigation team of the CID headquarters uh, would take over. And the remains are uh, also transferred to the police hospital in Accra uh, for further forensic uh, analysis. And uh, they've also uh, set up a two man uh, liaison team to be headed by the Bono Regional Police Command to liaise between the family and then the uh, Ghana Police Service by way of investigation to be to continuously update the family as to where they've gotten to and then if there are other things that needs to be done uh, through this uh, two-man liaison police officers, they will be able to deal with it uh, expeditiously. And uh, they are also entreating the general public uh, to come out with information because uh, the belief out there is that this is not a one-man activity. There could be other people behind the scene uh, pulling the strings. So people should uh, volunteer information uh, to, to assist the police in their investigations. Now, Precious, one of the motives being suggested is that this probably would have to do with ritual killings. Is there any credence to that? Well, it's it's... It's part of the, the, the narration and, and the assumptions, opinions of, of uh, people, community members, uh, relatives, uh, because they, they kind of ask themselves, why would you kill someone and then refrigerate parts of the body? Probably the intent is... to use it for that is why it's being refrigerated so probably uh there's the motive there's, there's a motive so uh, you will not be wrong if, if you uh you know attach or have or form such an opinion that is it's, it's for such a purpose now when the police went to the murder scene were they able to retrieve any implements, maybe cutlass or saws or anything that probably may have been used in uh, butchering the, the body? Uh, it is not really clear the, the quantum of or the kind of implements that the police, but the police had lots of or picked lots of uh, materials from the house and including the, the, the compound of, of the house, including a digging tool, and, and, and all that uh, from, from the house. Because uh, as you may have seen, uh, in one of the rooms, blood stains uh, all over the, the, the floor and, and all that. And 
uh, some drums with some substances and, and all that in it, uh, all has been taken away uh, by the police uh, to assist in the investigation. All right, thank you very much, uh, Precious Semevo. Precious Semevo has been following the, the case of the Abessim murders. The police have been to the community, the IGP, the acting IGP himself has been to the community. He's asked that the case be transferred to the CID, CID headquarters here in Accra. And so, yes, the police is taking up the issue. We've been trying to get to the police to see what the latest and what they can share with us. We have been unsuccessful so far, but we will be trying to see if we can get anything from the police. But it presents, a, it's a really tragic story that should worry every, any, anybody at all, especially parents. Because having been in a society where you know that your, your, your kids are not that safe, to the extent that your relatives may want to harm your children, to the extent of murdering them, that's, that's quite troubling anymore for, yeah, very, very for a troubling. mother. Yeah, I mean, of course, it, it speaks to everything we're afraid of, isn't it? You know how it is, you know, when you send your kids outside, you know, even when they just want to play outside or, you know, just want to walk outside, you know, and you're just worried, you know, about what could happen. And there's so many times that I've been accused of being a little bit too protective of my kids because I really won't send them next door to buy sugar or gari or, right. you know, I won't do that. You know, and there have been times when people have said to me that, you know, you're a little bit too protective, you know, you should let them go out and buy stuff, you know. And I mean, in my hood, I do see, you know, some of the kids my age, you know, walking around and playing football. But I'm just, I'm too scared. Even I'm like, ideally, it should be fine. I mean, it because be, we were be. sent out like that as kids. Exactly. I mean, I remember we used to gallivant, like serious gallivanting, you know, back in the day. But you can't do that with your children anymore. I mean, it's just, it's scary. And the more you hear stories yeah. like this, the more you want to keep them close, you know, you, the more you want to keep them indoors. And that takes something away from their you know, their childhood. And their though. development, exactly. yeah. Exactly. Children should be allowed to go out Exactly, there to, and know, explore free, yeah. and, and enjoy the neighborhood. It's unfortunate, but this is where we are in life. I just hope that this case, you know, is brought to justice, you know, and then we can maybe pick a few learners, learning points from, you know, what has happened. But I don't know. I don't know, Israel. It's, it's a difficult one. Yeah, very difficult one. All right, so you're watching the AM show. We're taking... A break, but we have more coming up. We'll be speaking about the Utah strike. We're expecting that the lecturers, well, they had indicated the last, uh, yeah, yeah. last Thursday when we spoke with them that they were going back, they were likely to go back to the classroom. Mm. So we'll be on the campuses to find out what exactly is happening. Do stay tuned exactly. in. We'll be back in a bit. <music> Hello, I'm Dori Nando. You can catch up with all the fun on the Cosmopolitan Mix and on all our shows via podcast. Just go to My Joy Online podcast and search for your favorite show and relive those moments all over again. Only on Joy 99.7 FM, radio for discerning listeners. All right, so we're moving on to our next conversation here on the AM. She has to do with the UTEC strike. Now, the strike has been called off or suspended, but we're expecting the lecturers to be back in the classrooms from today. Yep. And so we're asking you, the students, if you're watching us, you let us know if lectures have resumed. So just uh, we're going to put the phone numbers on the screen in a bit so you pick the phone numbers and give us a call but we'll also be speaking with the representative of UTAG and also speak with the NLC and get to know what's their position if they've actually resumed lectures as they had uh, promised that they were oh. going to do so yeah. we're getting on the line uh, Samuel Bert Wedukusi who's the UTAG president at UCC and then we'd also want to speak with Ufus who was the Executive Secretary of the National Labour Commission. So, uh, good morning. I believe we have uh, Samuel Bert Wedi Kisi, uh, the UTAC president, on the line. From yes, Kisi. good morning. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, good morning. So, have lectures resumed for you? Yes. Uh, lectures have begun uh, uh, across the various campuses 
indeed, I, I must say that uh, some lectures were even held over the weekend. You know, there are some campuses with weekend right. uh, yeah. schedules. So lectures uh, are in session. All right, and this is as a result of uh, the NLC, your issue with the NLC being, being taken out of court, right? Well, uh, multiple of things. It's as a result of uh, the commitment on the, on the part of uh, uh, government uh, and our employer are committing to, of course, a roadmap for us to sit down and negotiate within the shortest possible time. Uh, as well as, yes, taking uh, the, the issues of out of uh, court, discontinuing the case uh, which was pending before the court. Yes, so uh, the commitment and agreeing to a roadmap as well as uh, uh, taking the issues out of uh, discontinuing the issue, the case that was pending. Yes, yeah, which paves way for everybody to come uh, to the negotiation table with a clean mindset. Yes, so, so basically these are the issues. Okay, so the lectures have resumed, but the other issue that also has to be resolved is about the negotiations with uh, the NLC and government. How quickly is that going to begin? Yeah, let me clarify that the NLC actually is not a party in the negotiation all right. at all. all right. uh, the NLC, as you know by law, by regulation, more or less serves as a check to everybody, to all of us, uh, and then when, the, when there are issues, they are supposed to prevent uh, protracted uh, uh, I mean, uh, conflicts. Make sure that, uh, worst case, if we have to go to arbitration, they facilitate the process. So the NLC is not party to the negotiation. We're actually negotiating with the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission and the government side. So, yes, I'm aware that some me meetings have been scheduled for this week uh, as per the MOA that was signed to ensure that the negotiations begin in earnest. Yeah. So this week, do you know exactly when the meetings are being held? Well, tentatively, we, I think we're looking at uh, Wednesday. Wednesday. So tentatively, all things being equal, I think that there, there is likely to be a meeting on Wednesday. All right, please hold on for me. I have uh, Fusua Sama, the Executive Secretary of the NLC, uh, also on the line. Good morning to you, Mr. Fusua Sama. So where everybody must be happy that the lectures have, have resumed the lectures as they had promised. Yes, uh, good morning to you. Good morning to your listeners. Good morning to Dr. on the other side. Yes, everybody is happy, including myself. I'm happy, and I'm sure you are too. And um, <clears throat> like Doc just said, I think he said it all, that the NLC is not bad. Yes, Mr. Hussar, somewhere. All right, we seem to have lost uh, Mr. Fosa Samba, but we'll try and uh, reach him again. But yes, as he indicated, everybody else uh, should be happy that the lecturers have resumed as they had promised. And so the negotiations can begin. That's the negotiations between the Fair Wages, the lecturers, UTAG on one hand, the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, and then government on the other hand, so that we this can be resolved and settled properly so that we don't have to have a situation where lecturers are deciding to go on strike again and depriving the students and uh, denying students the opportunity to get their, their education, education. <laughs> and yeah. having their lectures disrupted and all of that. But uh, Mr. Samuel, but what, because if you're still on the line, I, I'd like to find out one of the concerns that the teacher, the, lect the students raise had to do with the examinations, they were hoping that they'll be given some time before the examinations begin. Is that something that UCC is considering? Well, uh, let me say that uh, the various universities are at different levels because of the COVID. We are all not at this at par. All right. Uh, while some are we're in the process of writing exams, others are still midway their semester. Okay. So. Uh, depending on where one finds itself, the, the, the management of the university, the academic board, would um, uh, quickly have to uh, readjust and come up with uh, new timetables to take care of uh, their peculiar situation. In UCC, for instance, I know we were 
midway the, the, the semester. We are not nearing examinations all right. at all. So I want to believe that uh, there will be few, I mean, a couple of weeks for teaching before examinations begin. And uh, I know KNUSC, uh, Ligon had different uh, uh, schedules that they were working with. So depending on uh, the situation, I'm sure management, academic board, will come out with a, with a circular to take care of the peculiar, peculiar needs of the, the student. Right, okay. Um, Mr. Boydi Kusi, I wanted to ask you, I mean, considering that you've gone back to work, so essentially you're back to teaching, um, do you, two questions, do you have faith that the negotiations will go in your favor? And secondly, is there a certain sort of concern about the fact that, I mean, really, your bargaining chip was the fact that you had withdrawn your services. So now that you're giving it back, are you expecting that things will move swiftly? Or have you left some room for the um, dragging of feet or the dragging of the process, you know, as we've come to know it? Well, well, the, the game at this point now, it's, it's faith to have faith in, 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 in the process. Uh, we recall that there were a bit of dragging of feet here and there, and that is why for us we think that uh, committing to do this in a period of one month, it's, it's significant. Okay. So we expect that uh, both parties, particularly on the side of government, and given the, uh, the commitment level that we have seen from the side of the, the Minister of Education, the Ministry of Employment and Labor, Labor Relations, and even... Uh, the Ministry of Finance, we, we want to believe that, mm. and knowing the, the challenges we have had, even uh, with the issues of having to suspend the strike and the processes we've, we've gone through and the challenges that are still lingering, we want to believe that uh, these parties would stay committed to uh, the MOA that we have signed and ensure that we, we, we execute this negotiation in, in faith knowing that uh, we want something better, uh, better for, our, for the UTAG members. And so, uh, yes, there are a few doubts here and there as to whether we will really achieve what we want and all that. But we want to believe that, uh, given the, the historical background to uh, issues with negotiation, you recall that for over a decade, UTAG has not been on strike. Yeah. So for UTAG to go on strike this time, it tells you that there is something really biting and and that is where leadership is also committed to ensure that we really get something meaningful, something significant out of this negotiation. So we, we actually, at this point, will only say that we can only hope for the best right. and uh, act in a matter of faith so that we, we hope that everyone will stay committed to the, to the process. Is there um, a plan underneath all of this in case after a month um, things don't go as promised? Well, uh, we, we, it will be too early for us to uh, begin to uh, speculate and uh, begin to issue threats. Uh, and I think that it is that uh, call that all of us decided that let's take even the, the case that was pending in court out so that okay. it's not as if anybody is putting a gun at our head to go and negotiate. Okay. So uh, we want to leave it open for now and see how things turn out. Okay. Sure. All right, I, I would want to bring in Mr. So Futsu Samwa, I believe he's back on the line, the Executive Secretary of the NLC. So we're yeah, speaking with you earlier and we, we lost you on the line. But one of the concerns that has come up is that the National Labor Commission, well, hasn't been that proactive in some of these situations. So that we're having UTAG having issues with uh, the government and Fair Wages and Salaries Commission and National Labor Commission does pretty little about it until they decide to go on, one party decides to go on strike, and then Utah NLC comes in. What is it that the NLC is doing this time? As um, we heard Mr. Boyd Wukusi say, he says you're not part of the negotiations, but is there a role you're playing to ensure that these things happen and we, we get some resolution to the issues? Well, like I was saying, and uh, I think. Uh, my colleague on the other side has said it all in the beginning. NLC is not a party to the negotiation. We, our role is established by law to facilitate the settlement of disputes and to settle disputes when they arise and to investigate issues related to uh, labor, unfair labor practices and so on. So 
So leave the case between them. You tag them, they are employed. That's the government. And for their conditions of services, the government represented by fair wages and salary in the uh, negotiating party with the Ministry of Finance and so on. All that the NLC set out to do from the beginning to this is to get the party to the table. Because right. like you said, um, at the point in time, they felt government was graduate, the government was not committed to the process, and therefore there was a need to take a certain form of action that is drawing their services to get them back to the table. And that is where, in the case of the worst scenario, the NLC I mean, came in to full force to get the parties to the table, resulting later in the court action. But at the end of the day, either in court or outside court, all that the NLC was set out to do and were doing was to get the parties to negotiate. So at a point in time when parties had agreed among themselves that they were ready to go to the table, then the court action wasn't necessary because, after all, that is what we were out to do there. So when they agreed among themselves, we also took the next step to withdraw the matter so that they go to the table and the call of the strike. And exactly that is what has been done. If we do the court action, that was on a Thursday, I think on Friday the strike has been called off weekend, they had their classes, and today the negotiation with the government team is going to begin. So I think we all of us are happy. Certainly, uh, we all had the uh, accusations that came here in the uh, right or wrong. I think uh, the most important thing is that we are now at the table. You see, um, I heard uh, one of your questions posed to my colleague on the other side as to whether you will have good faith in the faith in the negotiation that it will go their way. You see, if you are going to a negotiation table, and your hope is that at the end of the day, it will go your way and go. If you put that in your mind, uh, that will be a little difficult because a negotiation is a give and take. It shouldn't be like what you are taking to the table is what you will get. You could get it, it could be modified to get you something better or less your expectation. So let us manage our expectation. I don't know who the things are on both parties, but let's all manage our expectations. And then negotiate in good faith, like you said, you have to go to the table with a clean heart, having faith in the other side, just as you also expect to have in you. And with that, I think that uh, we'll have a solution to the pro uh, problem. Like you said, uh, for about 10 years or so, there hasn't been many major strikes in that front, and I think that that is quite commendable, and uh, we have to keep it. So my, my question is, does the, the NLC, NLC, beyond... Beyond bringing the two parties to the table, does the NLC have any other role at all? Or you're just going to, now that you've put them, you brought them to the table, you're going to step back? No, yes. We will step back and monitor the situation. All right. We will not be actively involved in the uh, negotiation, no. But if we are giving themselves a month to conclude negotiation, the NLC will be monitoring it closely to see that whatever timeline they have set for themselves, are being obeyed and adhered to. So that in case they are able to settle whatever they come out with, will be filed with the commission and adopted, the terms of settlement will be adopted by the commission. If they are unable, then the commission will now have to come in, set a compulsory arbitration panel because of the strike involved and have the matter settled All right. by members of the commission. So we will not just go to sleep, but we have to monitor because we have a role to play. At the end of the day, if they are successful, whatever they come out with will be adopted by the commission. And then later, see to it that it's enforced or whichever party that is part. If they are unable, then the commission will now have to take over the whole decision, set a compulsory arbitration panel, I mean, and make sure that it's um, All right. Thank you very much, Sofo uh, Sama, Executive Secretary of the National mm -hmm. Labor Commission. And earlier, we we're speaking with. Samuel Bedwedukusi, who is the UTAC president, University of Cape Coast. But we're also asking you on who we're asking you if you're a student of any of the campuses, give us a call on the numbers that you have on your screen. We want you to call us. Let us know what the situation is like. Obviously, for the UCC, we've heard the UTAC president say that in so, on some of the campuses, the lectures resumed over the weekend. would want to know what the situation is for 
the other university campuses. So give us a call. We have the numbers on your screens right now. I believe we have uh, someone on the line. Uh, Richmond. Hello, Richmond. Hello. All right. So which uh, tertiary university, well, tertiary institution are you and what's the situation there? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm actually a postgraduate student at uh, the Akantana Pia Menka University of Skills Training and Entrepreneurial Development at Asante Mampo Campus. Oh, all right. Uh -huh. So what I'll have to contribute is that uh, I think uh, university have, have your lectures resumed very, actually? Various universities have well, not sorry. actually been oh, forthcoming uh, with information. Richmond, and Richmond, I wanted to find out first of all if lectures have resumed for you. Uh, for us, not really. The undergraduate students were actually uh, supposed to have their exam the very day the strike started. So right. I'm sure if school is to resume, it will resume basically for the exam. All right. For us as postgraduates, I'm sure we are going to have lectures this week. Okay. So you were making a point. Yes. So my point was that uh, not particularly... Uh, for my university, but for most of my colleagues I've spoken with, I think university management has not been forthcoming with information. And uh, this has put uh, most of the students in such a dilemma that uh, they, they've had a difficulty understanding what is going on. And even as the strike has been called off or suspended, let me use the words of it, suspended, it appears students still do not know uh, what uh, it is that is in it for them this week. And I've spoken to a lot of students back at where I did my first degree and some I know in other universities and they are complaining that right. they are still waiting on university management to tell them what is in the week or the days ahead of them. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Richmond. Uh, from a team, I'm sorry about that. Now, we have Emmanuel also uh, calling from Drobo. Hello, Emmanuel. Yeah, hello. All right, so which institution are you and what's yeah, happening? Yeah. Like, I was schooling at, um, at Antimampong University of I, I can tell you, Apia Minka. All right. I Sa same as Richmond. Meaning that that was taken the day that uh, the UTEC groups went to strike. We were supposed to write our exam the day, and they went to strike, and we were supposed to vacate on 13th. So on the 13th, some of us, even most of the school, I percentage my half of the percent of the school stay outside of the campus. So at the time the strike came and we went back home, the, our landlords and landladies collect their distance keys from I us. So as at now I'm talking about when they say we should go back home, we should go back to school and write the exams. We don't get some place to sleep and write the exams. Even our financial and what you get to eat, some of us, you have to struggle and work before we get something. Before we... we... All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Imano. We also have Solomon, and he's also calling, calling from Asante Mampong. There seems to be a peculiar situation with... Uh, uh, Asante Mampong. Hello, Solomon. Uh, hello, Isa. All right. I believe you're calling from the same university yes. as uh, Emmanuel in Richmond. Then he, 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 that one should be telling you that we are more serious about going home. Uh, Isa, my issue is quite simple. You know, me, I'm in level 400 and I'm eager to leave. In fact, I've been asking for more than uh, four years. Even a colleague of mine is saying that we should, they should allow us to have another year that will give us M4 because we have spent more than seven, four years in the school. But the issue is that we want to leave. I'm coming. You want to leave. But um, those in level 100, 200, 300, most of them, you see, in our school, the school doesn't have enough hostels. So most of them are living, in, not even in a public hostel, they are living in somebody's house. Yeah. And their rents are due. They have sacked them. Now the school management is telling them to come back and write the exam. Where are they going to sleep? How they have been given out to somebody else? So we're only begging management that if it be possible, they should allow us to write the whole thing online. What we can't suffer at the cost of what Utah has done. It's not our fault. I get you. 
So yes. that's what we are pleading on management that they should allow us to write the whole thing online. All so right. those who have been stuck from their houses who have the benefit to write it from their homes. Okay. We want to leave. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Solomon. Let's go to Mohammed. Hello, Mohammed. Hello, Mohammed. Hello. Yes, Mohammed. Hello, Mohammed. Hello, good morning. Good, yeah, good morning. Where are you calling from? Please, I'm calling from Kumasi K University to be precise. All right. Hello. I've uh, lectures resumed for you. No, please. I've lectures resumed for you. No, please. Oh, okay. How come? What's happening? Hello, Mohammed. Yes, please. Stop, stop listening to us from your TV. We need you to listen to us through the phone. Basically, okay. We are, we are, we have been waiting for the, for management to release a communique for us. Back at Friday, waiting for them to release a communique for us. But we have been stranded here. We don't know what to do. I was on campus today. I've been seeing lectures around, but I cannot say lectures has resumed because we are waiting for an hour to be right to write our exam. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mohammed, uh, who has uh, his issue has uh, to do with gay USC. He says lectures have not resumed there. Uh, we have Peter Singh. Uh, Peter Singh, which university are you? I'm calling from Amsterdam. I have a in Minka. Okay. Uh, at Kumati campus. This one at Kumati campus. All right. Um, we are having the same challenges like uh, as uh, our friends from Mampong campus are calling. But our concern is that we are supposed to vacate on 13th. And to us, our academic calendar has ended on the 13th. So now all students have packed their baggages and we are at home now. Most are from the northern region, the Vota and Bonahaf and other regions. And our landlords are chasing us out from the rooms. Now, administration are asking us to come back and write the exams on the 30th of this month. And uh, you see, most of the students who are responsible, and even some of them are going through hardship in terms of financial constraints. But if the administration are asking us to come back and write, you see the extra burden that are going to be decided on the students. So we are pleading to the administration that it should allow us to write on LMS so that we too can organize ourselves a bit. That what that is our plea so that you have connection with them for them to listen to our plea. Thank All you very much. All right, thank you very much, uh, Peterson. There's a peculiar situation with uh, that university, uh, Pia Menka. Now, we have Martin also call, calling from Kumasi. Martin, what's the situation where you are? Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I'm calling from Kumasi, saying you're super excited. Kumasi where? Uh, yeah, Kumasi, saying you're super and USD, okay, great. Yes. Uh, the campus at hand, we still don't understand the banter between the tag and uh, government and that of the NLC. Before the closure of the school, we've received an official community from the Dean of Students that schools or school has been closed down and exams has been suspended indefinitely. We are aware that government will have a roundtable discussion with UTAC. But as I speak, we have not received an official community that if the roundtable discussion that the government is going to have with UTAC, that has warrant lecturers to come back to class and continue with classroom activity. So as I speak students on campus today, we are stranded. We don't know. There had been rumor that class or lecture starts today. But from what we've seen from government, that says that they will have a roundtable discussion today. That is different from saying that lecturers are returning back to the classroom. Now, hold on. Ma Martin, you're yes. saying there's supposed to be a roundtable. 
who's yeah. where, where are you getting that information from? Yeah, that is that is that is what I saw, and that is what I've heard. Because from as we checked with the the UCC president of Utah, he indicated that lectures, it's, in fact, some lectures have resumed on some campuses. They were supposed to have lectures over the weekend, and lectures happened. So I'm not sure about any round table before the lectures resume. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying, sir. We've, before the closure of the school, we've received an official community from the DOA, because they've been of students. All right. And if, if truly they have resolved the banter, we are expecting an official communi communication okay. from, from the Dean of Students. Okay. And, and we haven't received that yet. All right. And that is why we are still confused as to whether fully the government has actually resolved the matter with the UTAC or not. All right. But as far as you're concerned, you haven't seen the lectures returning to the lecture No, 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 no. All right. No. Okay. No. Thank you very much, Martin from Kumase. We have Israel also <laughs> calling. He's calling from Takwa. Hello, Israel. Hello, Israel. Hello, yeah, good morning. Good morning. Okay, so where are you calling from and uh, which university? I'm calling from Takwa, University of Mines and Technology, Yuma. All right, and have lectures resumed for you? No, please. Lectures have been resumed, yes. What, what is the school telling you? What are the authorities telling you? As it stands, we have heard the news accident that the strike has been withheld, but we haven't heard anything from management. We were due to start exam before the strike happened, but we were thinking that once the strike is over, we are going to resume exam probably this week. But as it stands, we haven't heard anything. Um, over over 50 percent of the students body is off campus, and it's, it's becoming a little difficult for them to to hold on. I mean, parents don't see why we should keep you in school when you are not doing so much. So. I mean, it, it warranted a lot of people the opportunity to go home. And I don't think it's a very good situation at all. Talking about some people having to apply for attachments with date specific, and then this thing happens. A lot of the companies are going to cancel the attachments to us that were already given out to people. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Israel. Okay, should we go to Joseph um, from Bibiani? Joseph, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Hi, where are you calling us from? Yes, I'm calling from Vivian but I'm a student of K University. Yeah, Come that's on. what I meant. Okay, so are you on campus this morning? I'm not on campus as I'm speaking now. Why? Yeah, you know, um, before the strike, uh, they gave us official communicate that lectures have been suspended to further notice. So most of the students have gone home, and those of us who are also uh, we were supposed to have exams, and the exams should have ended 21st of this month. But unfortunately, because of the strike, we couldn't have it. So after they have suspended the strike, most of us are expecting the school management to release that same official letter so that we will know whether we are going to have the exams or not. But after now, there's, there has been nothing as said. Okay, so you're waiting to hear um, some information from Kenya. Yeah, that's what we are school. hoping for today. And okay. there has been a lot of speculations around. Mm -hmm. You will see fake letters. Yeah. Okay. All right, okay. Well, I hope you hear some news soon. Um, let's move to Isaac, who's calling us from Winneba. Hello, Isaac. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, what school are you calling us from? Um, University of Education, Winneba. Okay, so do you have lectures today? Uh, no, please. Okay, why not? No, I'm um, University of Education. Yeah, I'm asking, how come you don't have lectures today? Actually, um, after my colleagues were staying from various campuses, we have, we have not even received any communique concerning whether there will be lectures just here and there. So the problem we are having now is um, the management must come out with any communique or information as to whether lectures begin, because most of the students are home now. And moreover, to concerning the accommodation issue, the University of Education, about 80% of students are living outside campus. They are not having hostels on campus. We are living outside. And most of them are home, as well as the hostel managers are also talking about academic year being ended. Therefore, okay. we should all pack and go. 
and even if possible, and we are to continue the semi, the remaining of the semester on campus, then we need to pay additional money for our hostels. Mm. Because most of them are asking us, our academy has ended, then we need to pack our things. So seriously, management needs to come out, whether we, we are to continue the remaining of our semester online, or something else must be done about it. Because the problem is about the accommodation now. And most of them are home. We don't know whether we have to come back and pay additional money for our hostel fees here and there. So we are pleading with management to see um, how best we can complete the remaining of the semester, either online or they should do something positive to help the students. Okay. All right, sure. Thank you very much, Isaac. And um, let's go to Legon. And we have Herman on the line. Hi, Herman. Hi. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. So have your lecture started? Well, for University of Ghana, because uh, we are in an exam period, and I don't think it would be a lecture. Herman, but can I, you speak up for me a little bit, please? Yes, because we are in the exam period, I don't think there's going to be a lecture. Rather, we just have to prepare for the exams, which is coming up soon. Okay, but have you heard anything from your, your lectures? Yes, the, the, there was a, an, a memo sent out by our email okay. that exams will be starting this week. Okay. But my concern rather is about the number of assignments we had in our Sakai, that is the, the software we used to submit online mm -hmm. uh, um, assignments, which is still there. But most of these assignments needed clarification before we do them. But due to the strike, we didn't have this clarification. But with this, this um, current news, it means we'd have to pile everything together with the exam, which is going to be quite burdensome. If, if they could do something about this by extending at least the, the deadlines for the submission of these assignments, it would in a way reduce that psychological burden and pressure on students to do the assignments and learning for the exam at the same time, which I feel is not fair if they have to go by that same deadline strictly. So this is what I think should be done. But for the exam period, and if the lecturers are around, I think I've seen a couple of them. We've had the information that the exam is started soon, and everyone is, uh, is quite ready. But this information is the only assignments that we need to Sure. Okay. Um, thank you for that, Herman. Let's go to Frederick, who's calling from Teshi. Frederick, good morning. Okay, so we lost Frederick. Um, call us back, Frederick, if you're listening to us. Remember, our phone lines are still open, 0302-211-691 or 0302-211-692. We'd love to hear from you um, if you're on campus, if you have lectures this morning. But the state of your... Um, mind is considering assignments, exams, hostel issues, seems like a whole floodgate of, um, of things that students are dealing with this morning. So give us a call and let us know um, what's up. But you know, Israel, in all of our conversations, we actually almost didn't think about the fact that, you know, some of these hostels and stuff would be asking for more yeah, money. Yeah. And the implication of that on, on students and their parents. So one of the, the uh, of course, pe people who are, who are watching or hearing the students complain, talking about oh, we, the lectures, they're asking us to come back. But if we have to go back, we, is anybody considering the fact that we would have paid our hostel fees up to a certain time, point, yeah. knowing that we would have been done with school mm -hmm. at that point. So if we're done with the school, we are not expected, but as it is now, we have now have to go and find money and then pay and pay uh, from when this this challenge is uh, particularly peculiar with the Apia Minka University yeah. of Skills Training, and so they are asking that the students, the authorities, allow them to have online to probably have online exams. So yeah, they don't have to be back uh, on campus. Not sure if they have the systems in place for that to happen. Okay. All right, sure. Um, good stuff. So should we speak to Professor John Japong? He's a Vice Chancellor, University of Allied, Allied and Health, Health and Allied Sciences. Sorry, Israel. Good morning, Prof. Good morning, Israel. How are you today? Fine, fine thank you. What's the, what's the situation on, uh, in your university as far as uh, the lecture strike is concerned? We know it has been suspended. Have lectures resumed? Um, well, lectures are expected to resume today. Um, you would recall that the 
following the discussions that were had between UTAG and NLP and the Ministry of Education and Employment and all the stakeholders, the UTAG leadership decided to have a consultation on the various campuses. So the various consultations happened on Friday. And uh, as far as I'm aware, all the campuses decided to spend the strike while they go back for negotiations. So on Saturday, uh, the processes are such that the local UTAC who called the strike here would have to inform the university management. So on Saturday, we received a letter from a local UTAC president basically communicating what we knew. And uh, before then, we had already started some consultation on how to uh, reactivate the and finish the academic year. So the registrar issued a letter on Saturday with details on uh, how the academic year is going to be completed. So there is a letter out there to the entire university community, which went out on Saturday, uh, basically saying that uh, uh, lectures, mop-up lectures and revision was going to happen for about two weeks, and then there will be two weeks of exam, and then there will be the vacation, and then students will go out to do what we call vocational training here, uh, because of we are in the of and allied sciences. We arrange for our students to have a practice in the field with various health institutions. So nursing students would have to spend some time in some other hospitals apart from our teaching hospital, gathering experience, and uh, the same with all the other professionals. So there's a clear roadmap on how to complete the academic year. Sure. Uh, I, I don't know what has happened on other campuses. But I believe, depending on how early the vice chancellors would have received any communication from the local UTAG, they would issue statements on how to complete the academic year. I am very, very sure that if it hasn't gone out already, by midday, almost all the companies would issue their statements. Right, so, Prof. It, it, it's clear that for you, has the communication has gone out there to the students, I believe, and so they are aware of what the rest of the academic year is going to look like. But the, I would want to believe the academic year itself has been affected because of the strike on some other campuses. Uh, I, I can think of Pia Minka, uh, University of Skills Training, for instance, they are complaining that many of them happen to be in hostels. And now that the academic calendar has been shifted, their rents have expired, and they're supposed to come back and pay. Do we have a, a similar situation where you have, at UHAS, you have a, a lot of your students being housed in hostels? Yeah, it's only so much that you can do as a university. Um, we have very to our uh, hostels for our students. So quite a number of them stay in private hostels. And uh, we actually, in the, in the information that went out uh, following the strike, we encourage students to remain on campus and uh, continue to do their revisions because we do not know when the strike will be called on. Uh, as to the private hostel arrangement, uh, there is very little that uh, we can do as vice chancellors individuals. However, I must say that for you, have, because we do not have uh, that many hostels, we actually go into an arrangement with the private hostel and rent these hostels on behalf of the university for the students. All right. So 
we collect the fees and give to the owners of the hostel. And the arrangement is that they pay for the entire academic year. Right. So his academic year has been dislodged by a week or two. Uh, I do not expect any owner of the hostel to come back and, and collect more money from us. I believe if you want to do that, it means you don't want to do business with us any longer. So I don't anticipate such a problem on our campus. There are other people who might have gone to rent uh, rooms in some private uh, houses that we will not be in the position to intervene. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor John uh, Japong, the Vice Chancellor, University of Health and Allied Sciences. And they seem to have uh, a, an interesting arrangement. arrangement uh, yeah. They have engaged the hostels or rented the hostels on behalf of the students. students and so, yeah. unlike the Akintia Pia Menka University of Skills Training, where many of the students are saying that they have been thrown out or they've mm -hmm. been thrown out of their hostels because their rents have expired. The, you have students shouldn't have, a, have any issues any with that, issue like which that. is fantastic. Yeah. Something else that would be really absolutely fantastic is if um, the lecturers or the administration of the schools can communicate clearly with the students. Yeah. We're sensing a lot of apprehension and anxiety. They don't really know what to do, you know, in terms of outstanding assignments, examinations, lectures, and all those things. And we know that, you know, communication makes the world go yeah. round. So definitely, you know, if you're listening to us, um, administrators, lecturers, please communicate with your students. And um, they're feeling a little bit anxious, understand understandably, um, so that they know what to do, and then we can make this smooth transition. You, you um, tend to see that uh, you has has done that quite effectively. Yes, yes. And they've actually shared that with us as well. As well, the but not KNUST, not, not Legon. Not KNUST. According no, Legon, to their students. Well, Legon, they're not complaining. They're really not good because they say they have been told. Yeah. And so, yeah. But they're not too sure if, you know, what was happening this week until they start exams. Yeah. So, right. clear communication anyway. It doesn't hurt anyone. I agree. So, all right. Um, so, we're taking a quick break. Um, when we come back, we'll have um, showbiz with IB. Before showbiz, though, remember we have that all important um, interview with Graphic Business and Stan Big Bank. Remember that there's a breakfast meeting coming up tomorrow um, on media and marketing communication post COVID, a catalyst for Africa's socio economic resurgence. So we'll bring you more details on that. And then after that, of course, showbiz news with Ivy. Don't go anywhere. Hi, this is Lexus Bill, host of Drive Time on Joy 99.7 FM. Listen, you don't have to worry if you miss Drive Time or personality profile. It's going to be live on our podcast page. Just log on to www.myjoyonline.com forward slash podcast. You can listen to Drive Time, personality profile and any other of your favorite shows on Joy FM on that page. You don't have to miss the show at all. Joy 99.7 FM Radio for discerning listeners. And I'm joined by two very interesting gentlemen to have a very interesting conversation um, about a very interesting breakfast meeting that's happening tomorrow. So I have Mr. Kojo Labi, who's a manager, communications at Stan Big Bank, and Mr. Theophilus Yate, who's an editor at Graphic business good morning good morning and um, of course we're talking about the graphic business stand big bank um, breakfast meeting that's happening tomorrow so um, let's start with you okay. um, why the theme the role of media in national development um, we decided to as graphic business as, as graphic communications group with our partners we decided that look this is the time to look at how to tell the African story better mm -hmm. um, post-COVID. Okay. Because um, a certain narrative is out there. And any time we talk about Africa, we, we are looking at the dark side of Africa. We are looking at the negative side of Africa. We are not looking at the positive side of Africa. So how can we tell our story? How can we encourage people? How can we mobilize? How can we ensure national coherence through the media? Because we recognize the role of the media in development. 
in development. So this whole discussion is because we think that we can, we can position the media as a catalyst for uh, the socio-economic resurgence of Africa post-COVID. Right, okay. So who are some of um, the speakers that we can expect? So we have Professor Kwame Kakari, mm -hmm. who happens to be the board chairman of the Graphic Communications Group. Mm -hmm. And besides being the board chairman, he's a very, um, he's, a, he's an authority okay. when it comes to media. So we decided that we should um, invite him to take part in this conversation. We also have the chief executive of uh, ABN Holdings, which is a media group, uh, Mr. George Chumesi. Then we have uh, Stephen Nasai Bwedi, uh, who is a digital marketer and also a communications expert okay. to, I mean, be part of the, I mean, the conversation. The minister to join us, the minister of information, Mr. Um, Mr. Kojo Ponkrumah, sorry, okay. I, I mean it's strange. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Uh, Mr. Kojo Ponkrumah, the Minister of Information, will also give us the keynote address and also okay. be part of the discussion. Okay, sounds good. Um, so Kojo, who is this targeted at, you know, all of this good stuff? My sister, thank you very much. Um, I think the broader one will be the larger society mm. and then the media itself and then everybody who has an interest in it. How Africa stands. Interestingly, about 10 years, 12 years ago, there was an article by one of these um, big media houses, and uh, the thing was talking about Africa rising. Mm. In, for some strange reason, around the time that the article came out, you saw that a lot of um, foreign direct investment into the continent went up. What it meant was that people saw the narration about Africa in a very positive light. It made it smart for them to invest in the continent. So things were on, on the road for us. And then we had some hiccups and then COVID hit. Now, as you were saying, how do we ensure that the narrative that is seen mm. is positive enough to spare people on, give us hope, mm. and so on. So the marketing communications unit, for example, or industry, mm -hmm. will be the framers of what the story is. The media comes in because yourself and all the other guys in this uh, sector will be the channel to get people to understand that there is belief, there's a need for belief, there's positivity around, we can make it. I come from a brand or a bank where we believe in Africa's um, growth, right? That's why we are in Ghana. And I also believe that, look, we need to find new ways for inspiring hope so that we can make dreams possible. That's what we stand for as a bank. So this is like um, a platform we are using to get people, I, I don't, can I have another word for conscientize? Mm -hmm. But just getting people to understand that it is possible. Yeah. We can do it. Okay. COVID or no COVID. There are many positive stories. Mm -hmm. And um, do you like pizza? Well, yeah. Yes. Would you believe me if I said pizza is just bread with, with, with gravy? Of course. And how would you find it in the next 10, 20, 15 years if Uwache is on the menu in Russia or China? That would be amazing. It will happen because we would be projecting yeah. or making people understand the great things about society. I use food as an example. Of course. But I'm trying to say that no matter whichever aspect of our economy you look at, there are positives that can be sold, mm -hmm. there are narrations that we can redirect, mm -hmm. and there are things that can get the average Ghanaian, the higher up, the stakeholders, the political leaders to all understand that we can do it. Okay. But let this platform be the cause or the catalyst for starting the conversation running. Okay. And that's the idea. Well, that sounds um, really good. Usually it's a physical conference, a physical breakfast meeting. Um, it's looking like it's a little different this year. Yeah, it's, it's a hybrid. Okay. So select number of people, you know, you have to listen to the, the protocols, go by the protocols. So mm -hmm. we have a hybrid where key stakeholders will be in the hall, okay. no more than 50 people. Okay. And then you have the virtual lecture. Okay. So our partners, like um, your unit here, um, the social media handles of both Stambic and Graphic Communications Group, and then all the other partners will also be beaming it. So we'll get a chance to have our, the larger society to mm. partake 
in the interesting conversations that will roll out tomorrow. Okay, and of course, it'll be live here on AM show and yeah. on um, the Super Morning show as well on Joy FM. So just before you go, um, Theophilus, mm -hmm. you've, you've done this for a few years now. Yes. Um, do you feel like the impact that has been made has been good? And are you expecting to make more of an impact this year, especially with such an interesting um, topic this year? Yeah. Um, the impact has been good. And a key indicator is why Starbuck has still been part of this marriage all these exactly. years. Exactly. They haven't yes. divorced. No, they we haven't, haven't divorced you. We are, still, we, are still, we are still good partners. So that is one indicator. And also the fact that, um, like you said, it triggers a certain conversation. Um, we normally look around and we pick topics that are not the everyday discussion, are not part of the everyday discussions. So we, we are looking at um, media and marketing communications, for example. So um, it can never get boring. It's, it's, it's only a catalyst. It just gives the platform for further discussion and also throw more light on how you can, I mean, awaken certain um, thinking. Uh -huh. Right, well, that sounds really good. We're looking forward um, to it tomorrow. How can people join, those who want to join by Facebook or Instagram? So you go to uh, Daily Graphic uh, Facebook Live. Okay. We are there. And also, um, like you said, if you go to Stambik, um website, you'll find You'll also be there. there. So okay. We are, we, are, we, are all, we are on all the social media handles. Okay. That's of fantastic. That's absolutely fantastic. And of course, um, it will be live here on the AM show as well and on the Super Morning show on Joy 99.7 FM. Thank you very much to Mr. Kojolabi and um, to Mr. Theophilos Yate. Remember, it's tomorrow. I'll bring you all the details um, right after this. And um, IB is coming up as well, so don't go anywhere.